Our, uh, our next speaker is a uh, psychiatrist in private practice. He is the past president of the Kansas Medical Society and has served on the executive committee of the Kansas Medical Society for the past six years. He's also uh, an alternate delegate to the AMA House of Delegates, where he represents the Overland Park Regional Medical Center in the organized medical staff section. Uh, he has served on the board of directors of the Kansas Health Insurance Association, which administers high-risk pool for the uh, state of Kansas. Uh, he also has written and spoken extensively about health insurance reforms, medical inflation, the patient-physician relationship, individual responsibility, freedom of choice, and privacy in medicine. He's here to talk to us today about health insurance, medical inflation, and the patient-physician relationship. Please welcome Dr. Richard Warner. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, before I uh, get into the talk itself, let me just tell you a little bit more about myself uh, so you can kind of understand the, the context of uh, my observations. I am in private practice uh, of psychiatry in Overland Park, Kansas. I make my living completely from uh, talking to people one at a time uh, through the course of the day. Uh, most of my practice, uh, I would say, is a cash basis uh, that I uh, ask people to pay uh, at time of service and m most of my patients are out of network from their PPO and they uh, then take my statement and file their own insurance and that works out very well for uh, the bulk of them. Um, I do also participate in Medicare and Blue Cross and Blue Shield so I have some familiarity with uh, uh, third party payment as well. The, um, I'm going to start with what would probably be a, a, a almost universally agreed to proposition, which is that everyone should have health insurance. Um, I, it's, this has become the, uh, the center point of uh, political discussions and um, much time uh, by organized medicine, by uh, politicians by any number of organizations uh, that are active today are seeking to answer the question of how can we provide everyone with health insurance. And the, uh, the, the, the focusing completely on the question of how should we obtain health insurance uh, very often obscures a different question which I'm going to suggest is just as important and that is how should we structure health insurance. Uh, because how we structure health insurance ends up having a tremendous effect on such things as medical inflation um, and ultimately the viability of the patient-physician relationship. The reason everybody would, is so insistent that, that we must all have health insurance is very simply, medical care is expensive and if people do not have some, uh, some uh, help in, in obtaining uh, their care financially, uh, then people will fall into poor health and have bad outcomes. But the other side of the question is that to what extent does the health insurance itself aggravate the medical inflation and create its own need because uh, of driving up uh, the, the pricing of medical care? So I'm going to suggest that we take some time and, uh, and look at a couple of questions, namely how do, what effect is health insurance having on medical inflation? And then secondly, what effect is it having on the patient-physician relationship? Now to put this in some context, medical inflation doesn't just happen on its own and we have to begin with understanding that we live in an inherently inflationary regime. I've put up a, a tracking of inflation that starts in the year 1913. That's the year that the Federal Reserve System was created. And we have, and, and interestingly, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, has as its primary mission the maintenance of price stability. And what I've done is I've taken the consumer price index as it is provided by the Bureau of Labor and Standards 
And I took the year 1913 and, and created it as the index year and, and gave it a value of 100. And then every subsequent number after that just represents the percentage increase in that in, in, uh, index that has occurred. That's the blue line, the CPI. The green line is an interesting shorthand for inflation. It's just simply the cost of a postage stamp. In uh, the year 1913, a, a, a first-class postage stamp cost two cents. It had cost that for about 30 years, and it would cost that for another 20 years when it finally went to three cents. But it's a very interesting phenomenon that it, you will see how the green line intertwines with the blue. That the cost of, of sending a first-class uh, uh, mailing precisely mimics the, the, the effect of inflation in our society in general. And so it's kind of a useful thing. That two cent stamp in 1913 is now a 42 cent stamp. Now, if you look at this um, graph, you see things get very interesting here in the mid 1960s. There's, there's practically an inflection point there where inflation has taken off much more uh, aggressively. If we were to take just the, 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 the area to the left of here and put it on its own graph, we would still be impressed with the inflation. It would just be on, on, on that particular graph, it would, it would spread out more and we would think, my goodness, our, our regime that is supposed to provide price stability doesn't really seem to accomplish that. But then things get much more dramatic uh, in the mid to late 1960s. Well, several things occurred then. We were fighting a, uh, an overseas war in Vietnam, um, and we were also undertaking a, a major change uh, called the Great Society, uh, in which we moved into uh, essentially welfare state economics with so many assistance programs. And all of this resulted in our going increasingly into deficit financing. Other things happened in the mid-1960s. Silver, which had been the backing for Federal Reserve notes, uh, lost that connection. And uh, where you could previously take a $1 Federal Reserve silver certificate and present it and, and expect to be provided a certain amount of silver in return, uh, that in fact was severed. Uh, and in 1968, uh, it was no longer possible to use your silver certificate and, and obtain silver from the Treasury. In 1971, Richard Nixon finally separated the U.S. dollar from gold altogether. In 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had really taken the United States off of a gold standard, uh, that American citizens could no longer own gold, but foreign central banks could still exchange their dollars for gold. And so to that extent, there was still a, a gold standard backing the United States dollar. Uh, but Richard Nixon found in the uh, early 1970s that the demand to exchange those dollars uh, for actual ounces of gold was gaining such uh, uh, momentum that it was in danger of depleting our gold standards. And so he, as was said, closed the gold window and uh, the United States essentially uh, defaulted on the proposition that uh, U.S. dollars could be exchanged for gold from the U.S. Treasury. Nixon said at the time, um, and, and at, at the same time was, was openly adopting deficit financing uh, and eventually trying to contain inflation with wage and price controls, and so he made the statement, we're all Keynesians now, referring to John Maynard Keynes, the great British economist who had laid much of the found work uh, for this kind of government uh, intervention. What uh, President Nixon didn't seem to pay so much attention to was a statement of John Maynard Keynes that he had made in 1920 in a book called The Economic Consequences of Peace. 
um, in which Keynes wrote, there is no subtler nor surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which no one man in a million is able to diagnose. That is a statement I would suggest is worth contemplating, probably worth reading once a week and thinking about what in the world was John Maynard Keynes talking about when he said that. And if you stop and think about what effect this, this uh, major eruption of inflation has occurred where something that cost $100 in 1913 would now cost $2,100 in, in our current economy. What effect has that had? I, I would suggest to you it's had, you know, you could, if you start thinking about this, uh, it has many. In, in the realm of medicine, I think it has a lot to do with the outrageous uh, uh, liability uh, judgments uh, that, that we all live with and, and, and fear. It, it has just simply become too easy to think of distributing millions of dollars to somebody. The, 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 the meaning of a million dollars just simply isn't what it used to be. Um, years ago, Everett Dirksen in the Senate made a, a, a remark that, that caught a lot of attention. You know, a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there. After a while, you're talking about real money. There's been a desensitization that has occurred to large sums of money over the time that ends up uh, deforming the value of most everything. Now, when Keynes says that no one man in a million is able to diagnose the problem of, of inflation, I think one of the things that he's talking about in saying that uh, is that we think inherently uh, a, a price is something that, that, that is simply attached to the things that it, repre that it may represent. And so we say, you know, the price of houses has gone up, or the price of oil is going way up, or the cost of a first class postage stamp is going up. Can you imagine it now costs 42 cents to mail uh, a letter? You know, you know, how can it have gotten so expensive to mail a letter? We think of prices as things that are, that, as something that's attached. And what we miss is the fact that price inflation is simply an effect. The cause is monetary inflation. It is not simply that the price of a letter has become so expensive. It is that the value of the dollar has become so small. It takes a whole lot more dollars to, buy, to mail that letter uh, than it used to. And this monetary inflation is very much related to constant expansion of the money supply and the backing of our money supply with federal debt. The, 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 the American money supply is no longer backed by something real like so many ounces of gold. It is backed by nothing but debt, promise to pay. Uh, and it's in, in that in sense, it, it is infinitely expandable. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have lost control of the price and, and value of, of a dollar. Now, to translate that rather, um, I think, basic point into day-to-day uh, -day reality, we should understand what we mean by a price. A price is simply the point of agreement between a buyer and a seller and the exchange of money for goods and services. In our culture, we tend to think prices are set by sellers. We tend to think that, that uh, evil oil companies set high prices in, in, in uh, uh, oil, and we think that evil pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies charge high prices for their prescriptions, and greedy doctors and greedy hospitals charge high prices. What we pay no attention to is the fact that any price is a point of agreement between a buyer and a seller. And we pay very little attention to the role of buyers in agreeing to prices, and instead focus on sellers, and therefore attempts to contain inflation so often become attempts to, 
to impose control on the behavior of sellers in the setting of their prices with very little attention paid to the role of the buyers. Now, to look at it differently, it would help to see that inflation is simply the devaluing of money in relation to the things that it would buy. And if that's true, I think it further helps to think about the experience of using money and so that a buyer, in essence, experiences three different kinds of money. There's the money I have. I actually have some money in my billfold. And there's the money that I expect to have. It's money that I don't have on me, I don't have in my checking account, but I know what I'll earn in the next week. I'll know what I'll earn in the next year. I know, you know what I can expect to be had come in, and, and I can do a certain amount of purchasing with the thought that I can pay for it in the future, and therefore I can use credit, and it becomes a different kind of money. Now, I would suggest it's easier to spend, it's easier to devalue the money that I will obtain in the future than it is the money that's in my pocket. I'll part with the money in my pocket a little less readily than the money that I might have on my credit card. And the country as a whole does that. We undertake massive spending programs uh, that, uh, that they impose debt on generations yet to come rather easily because it's a different kind of money than the money we actually have. And then there's a third kind of money that's particularly important in, in understanding health insurance and, and its influence, and that's money I'm entitled to. That's money in the form of an, of an insurance payment, whether it comes from a private insurance plan or it comes from the government, either one. It represents money from some pool that I only vaguely understand, but I know it's the government or I know it's some big insurance company. I know they have gobs of it. And so, you know, what I happen to spend doesn't really matter all that much because it just comes out of some very large pool. And therefore, I, if I happen to need something and I'm entitled to uh, the money that would pay for it, I don't really concern myself with what the price of that transaction may be. I'll just figure that the money that I'm entitled to will cover it. Now, if you take that experience and think how that works in the medical world, you might start with thinking about health insurance itself. Only about 6% of the people in this country own their own health insurance, and those that do buy it with their own money, money they have, money they expect to have uh, through the coming year. And so they look at it with a question. What do I get for my money? They look for value. And what people who buy their own health insurance will tend to do is they will tend to buy higher deductible health insurance that will protect them from the catastrophe of a serious illness or an injury. But they know they're going to pay for most of their day-to-day -day medical care themselves. And so you, now it is possible, and one would hope, that they would also get a health savings account to go with this higher deductible insurance so they have money of their own available ready and then the, and they will use that with discretion and they will be interested in the price of most anything that they're paying for out of that health savings account. But that unfortunately is about six percent of our population. Um, most of our population, uh, upwards of seventy percent, obtain their health insurance either as a benefit of employment or as an entitlement from the federal government. And so they ask a different question. They simply ask, what do I get? If they are paying money themselves, it is some relatively smaller portion of the premium. And when people who have employer-provided insurance complain that their insurance is getting so expensive, Generally, they're complaining that their portion of that amount is going up, and they will still have no concept of what the price of the actual insurance is itself. 
And so they're free to indulge a fantasy of what their insurance should do for them and what they expect of it. And so with a mass of the population simply asking the question, what do I get, and applying political uh, considerations in, in, in obtaining that, what we have generally gotten is insurance that's structured with low fixed copayments and deductibles, all in an attempt to spare patients all but the least costs of their care. <clears throat> and so we have, I think, to, to pay a, a, some attention to patient cost sharing arrangements. Now this is shifting in the last few years. And there is, uh, uh, there is awareness that employers uh, are looking for their employees to absorb more of the costs. But they do still tend to use uh, vehicles that are structured with fixed amounts of money. And so you have to distinguish between a fixed dollar copayment or a percentage based coinsurance. Took me a while to actually to come to appreciate the, the importance of that distinction. Fixed dollar copayments means that the patient just pays a certain fixed amount of money. This is most commonly the case, say, in pharmaceutical benefits, where the patient may have a $20 copayment, or if it's a sophisticated three tier arrangement, they may pay $10, $20, or $50, depending on uh, the, uh, the, the medicine's status in a formulary. But the point is, it's a fixed amount of money, and the patient has no reason at all to be concerned with the actual retail price of the prescription. That's a mystery. They're only aware of the copayment. Coinsurance, on the other hand, is percentage based, and therefore the patient has very much reason to be aware of the price of whatever the transaction is, whether it's the hospitalization or the uh, the price of the prescription um, or the doctor's visit, if, if that happens to be set up on a coinsurance basis. And so patients do have some price sensitivity then. And so it's useful, I think, to understand two concepts as they apply to cost sharing arrangement. One is first dollar responsibility, which is to say that if the transaction occurs, the patient is going to be participating in that. They may be paying all of it if it's under their deductible. They may be paying some good portion of it, if, if, depending on what the copayment may be. Uh, and so this will affect utilization. This will affect the decision, do I or do I not? buy that uh, medicine, get the prescription filled, go and get that test, uh, let the doctor perform the procedure that he's recommending to me. Um, so first dollar responsibility very much affects utilization, but it doesn't have any effect on the pricing. For pricing to be affected in the transaction, the patient needs to have some responsibility for the last dollar. Uh, and, usually, and that will occur, again, if the, if the patient is, is paying for something under their deductible limits, or if they're paying something and they're above their deductible, but they're paying a percentage of it, uh, and therefore they are participating in the price. Now, the effect of our having all of these uh, low fixed dollar costs over time is a graph that looks like this. Starting in the year 1939, data has it that, that we used to pay for 89% of our medical costs out of pocket. And that has steadily gone down over time. Uh, the most recent figure, I think, is from 2006, and if I recall, it's 14%. And so there's been a massive shift in, in, in the financial responsibility from the patient to a third party payer with third party payers now paying 85% of the freight. Interestingly, if we look just from 1960 forward, this is to look at inflation again. The blue line again is the consumer price index. 
The red line now is the medical care service index. This is, a, this is a subset of the CPI that the Bureau of Labor and Standards collects every month. And uh, actually, if you think about it, since the red line, the, the, the medical care service index, is a subset of the CPI, the CPI wouldn't be as high as it is if, if you didn't have medical uh, costs figured in there. So it pulls up the blue line, but it also far outstrips the blue line. And the other interesting thing is I, I did just a simple calculation that you can see below the graph comparing uh, the first 23 years, 1960 to 1983, uh, to the 24 years that followed. I just basically divided it in half. And in that time, in, in the earlier time frame, the ratio of the increase in the medical care index to the CPI was 1.8. It rose 1.8 you know, times uh, the rate of the CPI. But in the last 24 years, it's rising again more rapidly. So. You know, the, the, the net message from all of this is that we have ongoing inflation, always have had in our economy, and then the medical uh, care is, is simply all the more uh, dramatic on top of that, and it seems to match uh, very much the phenomenon of the decreasing responsibility of patients uh, and, and participating in the actual pricing. Now, when, uh, when Keynes said that no one man in a million can diagnose the inflation, of course, if you don't have a proper diagnosis, then you tend to come to, we tend to use improper treatments. And, uh, and so what we tend to do is try to repress the inflation. That's a phrase from uh, Wilhelm Repke, the great German economist, very much responsible for much of Germany's post-war rebuilding. Uh, and he wrote a, a, a short lecture on, uh, on inflation. Uh, and, he, and he used this phrase, repressed inflation. Now, as a psychiatrist, uh, I actually haven't thought about repression in quite a long time. That was standard fare when I was trained. But as we get less Freudian, we don't think about repression so much. But it means you know, the active participation, usually out of conscious awareness, of something that is, that is threatening. And so we try to repress inflation uh, either through the use of price controls, which is what Medicare does, and which is what insurance plans that key themselves off of Medicare do. They just simply say, you know, here's the price we're going to pay. If it doesn't bear much relationship to what your fee would normally be, well, that's, you know, sad fact, but the price control is what it is. But the other uh, way in which uh, we, we try to contain this inflation, or, or I, I more properly say, uh, contain the effects of the inflation, which is the effect on overall spending, is through the bureaucratic management of care. Which then takes us to the whole question of the effect of all of this on the patient-physician relationship. I want to take just a minute and tell you a little vignette from my practice. I have a patient in her early 50s, she's 50 years old, um, who came to me about a year and a half ago, uh, very depressed, you know, had, 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 had uh, really been reduced to a low level of functioning in her own personal hygiene um, and her uh, uh, just involvement in, in, in daily activities because she had become so consumed in the care of her aging and, and ultimately dying mother. She came to me about a week before her mother died. Uh, she is somebody who had an extremely close relationship with her mother. It was a very touching thing to see. And she had uh, been involved in several of the medical decisions that have, had affected her mother. 
Um, and then I worked, have worked with her ever since then, and, and, and you, know, you might imagine she had a very powerful grief response and mourning uh, to the loss of her mother. And after I'd been working with her for about a year, she came in one day, smile on her face, and said, Dr. Warner, you're seeing the new Janet. Actually, this is the old Janet. I feel more like myself now than I have felt in a long time. I said, really? What, you know, what has happened? He said, well, it's interesting. I went to see my doctor on Monday. I called. I've had a bunch of things that have bothered me. I've, I've told you about them. I, you know, I, my leg just doesn't seem to work right, and, and you know, I have strange sensations. And uh, I just decided it's finally you know, time, and I've, I've got to go in and, and get this evaluated. And so I called my doctor, and he said, come in at 4.15. And I went in. And I didn't leave the office till 10 after 5. You know, he had taken care of my mother, and we spent time talking about that. And, uh, and he told me how much everybody in the office loved my mother, and how much they loved me, and, and, and how much they had cared to see me go through what I had. He reassured me that all those decisions we had made, we made the best decisions with what we had at the time. You know, and then after we talked about that, he asked me, you know, what did I come in for? And I told him about my leg and, and the sensations I'd had and so forth. And, and I told him what I was really worried about is that I had multiple sclerosis. And, uh, you know, he, he sat and listened and, and, and took careful note of all of this. And, and he said, well, I, I tell you, Jen, I'm going to go ahead and order a number of tests. but." Based on my examination and based on the history, I really don't think you have multiple sclerosis, but I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that with some testing. And, uh, you know, it just took a big weight off my shoulders. I just, I, 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 I don't think I'd known how much I was worrying about that until I really sat down and talked with him about it, and, and he helped me with it. Now, interesting thing is, she didn't seem to remember at the time that she and I had talked about this several times, and I told her I didn't think she had multiple sclerosis, but she ought to get her doctor to you know, look at that question with her. But what I told her at the time was that, you know, what was remarkable, I thought, was that her doctor was in the position to take the time and to make the kind of intervention that only he could make. He honestly had not said anything to her that I had not said to her, but in a very different context. He was the doctor who had been through this and a, and, and, you know, a bunch of other things with her. He was uniquely positioned to deliver a curative statement, which leads me then to my second proposition. You know, I began by saying everyone should have health insurance. Well, I would equally say everyone should have 55 minutes with their doctor sometime. And if we have a, a, a health insurance regime that makes that difficult and makes that a, 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 a fading possibility, then I think we have real difficulty. A few years ago, it occurred to me, as I was reading a, a book by uh, the economist Thomas Sowell, actually you know, a couple of books that he wrote. One is called The Vision of the Anointed. Another is called uh, The Conflict of Visions. And what he talked about is the fact you know, that it's something I've wondered about. You know, the people with what we call liberal points of view and people with what we call conservative points of view can talk to each other all day long and they seem to have no impact on each other. Uh, and what Dr. Soule pointed out is that they have different basic visions that just don't incorporate each other's thinking. And he, and he traces this back basically, I think, to the time of the French Revolution and, and going forward. Uh, and in essence, distinguishes between those who are great believers in planning and therefore leading to centralized planning, 
uh, and those who believe that things happen uh, spontaneously uh, and freely and, and, and accomplish uh, things just as or more productively. And so whether we're talking about Karl Marx and Adam Smith, it's the same thing, it, it, differing visions. Well, it has occurred to me that we actually have two competing visions of medical care and what it is operating today. And one is the, something that I would ima imagine almost everybody in this room grew up with, still thinks is the basic vision, doesn't even think of it as a vision, just the way it is. And it's what I would call the personalized vision of health care. And at its center uh, is the patient-physician relationship. It has an ethic embodied in the Hippocratic tradition in which the doctor is simply there to address the medical and other needs of the patient, the individual patient, that's the whole focus, is what do I need to do to help this patient? And its long-standing tradition is that it is a professional service and the patient would, uh, would have some resp financial responsibility for that. It is supported by financial and clinical systems, that is to say insurance companies and hospitals whose job it is to support whatever the doctor and patient are trying to accomplish. It recognizes that the, the, that the central uh, skill of a physician is to arrive at a diagnosis. And just as uh, it, 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 it involves a patient going to a physician and saying, I suffer with something, and the doctor engages in that and interviews the patient and, and gets the patient to tell a story and hears things and follows hunches and gathers appropriate information and arrives at a, a diagnosis which is just an explanation. Uh, and, and I like to remember the words of my old English professor, Frank Nellick, when he would say, an explanation is simply that which satisfies the mind. It shouldn't be confused with the truth. You know, we're satisfied at different levels with explanation, and it's the doctor's job not to be too easily satisfied, you know, to think what are the various possibilities. Now that takes long experience and education, and some real wisdom to accomplish. And it isn't done by a system. Most of people, if you, if you, you know, understand how, you know, so many people, particularly in what I'm going to contrast this with, think of medicine as an application of a bunch of procedures. This doctor does that, this doctor does that. You know, this doctor takes out gallbladders, you know, this one, uh, you know, works on your eyes, but it's all procedure oriented. And, and, and what is so generally unappreciated is what it takes to make the diagnosis to know what to do in the first place. And then to have, you know, the, the skill and the freedom to revise that diagnosis and to know when the diagnosis isn't getting the result that you want and either revise the treatment or, or maybe even revise the whole diagnosis. It's an ongoing process. Patients judge that. They judge if their doctor takes the time, shows the interest, becomes involved with them enough to help them to, to, to be satisfied that they really have been evaluated. The people who do this tend to be apolitical. Yeah, we all know who we support, but we don't do it very actively. You know, politicians complain doctors are the worst givers and, 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 and you know, because we just, we simply, you know, we, we, we take care of our patients and that's what we do. Well, contrast this with what I would call the system-oriented vision of healthcare, which is much more population-based. It deals in statistics. 
It's collectivist. It has egalitarian goals. And governments plan it. You know, when, when you hear statistics that say, oh, the United States ranks 37th in, in, in the world in, in medical care, it, 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 you know, it's because there is some fantasy of egalitarianism in which, you know, scale the United States somehow, you know, is, is deficient. I mean, there are all sorts of, of reasons behind these, these kinds of statistics that are, are quoted. But it has nothing to do with individual care of a person with something that they actually suffer and go to a doctor to get some help with. The system has replaced the patient in assuming financial responsibility. And you know, a fascinating thing has happened in the last uh, couple of years. I attend uh, regional liaison meetings with uh, CMS uh, uh, on behalf of the Medical Society. And for years and years, the administrators of CMS would refer to Medicare as the payer. About a year and a half ago, I learned that Medicare is not the payer. Medicare is the purchaser. Um, if you talk to health benefit professionals, they increasingly use this language. You know, I, uh, a person will say, you know, I have a, a company of 50,000 employees. I purchase the health care for 50,000 people. Well, there's a big difference between a purchaser and a payer. A purchaser actively, you know, is the one who seeks value, who makes judgments of quality. Uh, and so, increasingly, the so-called purchasers of health care believe that they need information, statistical information, that allows them to justify the decisions they make. And so we see then the growth of things like pay for performance programs. You know, all of them using statistical measures, all of them, again, treatment related. You know, all, all these perform, pay for performance measures all presume that the patient has been correctly diagnosed in the first place, as Dr. Dolliner has well pointed out to us. And so they apply standardized treatment to standardized diagnoses and the quality is judged statistically. It's a very different world and yet this is becoming the culture. You know, what I described first, the Hippocratic tradition, is the way it simply was and somebody who, you know, looked at it in a population-based sort of way yeah, they, were, they were entirely welcome to do that and, and they would provide valuable insights. I, you know, I kind of joke sometimes that, you know, when I was in medical school, <clears throat> the Department of Preventive Medicine was for very geeky people um, that, uh, that, that, the, that the clinical faculty had, had no use for at all. Well, today, I think we're living in the revenge of the preventive medicine uh, uh, departments because the population-based way of looking at things has become the dominant one, and if you maintain your practice in the Hippocratic tradition, you can do so, but you do that with a great deal of, of individual decision and, and persistence, and, and uh, you, are, you are going against the tide of things any longer. You know, the, the world has shifted that much. Well, I want to use that thinking then just to touch on a few of the areas that have become so important in discussions of, of economic, health economic policy and, so, and show how, how you look at these things depends completely on whether you are what I will call uh, personalized or patient oriented versus third party dominance. And the first of these is the matter of price transparency. Um, I, I think it's one of the most common statements made today is, is that we, we absolutely need more price transparency, which is to say, you know, people, you know, if they're going to make a, an informed judgment of something they're going to buy, they have to know what it costs. They have to may, may be able to make a judgment as to what it's worth. Well, in a world in which patients have that last 
as well as first dollar responsibility, where they're involved in the pricing, they will demand price transparency. You know, to the extent that the market is oriented in that direction, there will automatically be price transparency. There is no need to legislate for price transparency. But if you're in a world that's 85% dominated by third party payers, price transparency is meaningless. You know, I, I have a fee that I charge most of my patients. I send it into Medicare. It's irrelevant. You know, back comes whatever the allowable fee is. There is no reason on earth that anybody who, you know, wants to make a Medicare based decision should know anything about my overall fee because it's not relevant to them. What you get instead of true price transparency, you know, in the third party dominated world, are things like the distortions of group discounting. Um, we heard earlier today about, you know, disparities of, of you know, a, a bill being, the real bill being 10% of the charge bill. I'm sure everybody in this room has had that uh, experience. Uh, my wife, uh, just a few years ago, had an operation in one of our very good hospitals. Um, four days in the hospital, comes the hospital bill, $12,000 with the note, you know, don't act on this. And then uh, the insurance company takes action and the insurance company says, nope, you know, the insurance company is going to pay $2,400, the Warners are going to pay $600, you hospital are going to eat $9,000 of this bill. It was discounted away, you know, by 75%. These stories are very common. I hear them in my practice all the time. And so what we have is incredibly distorted pricing for the purpose then of discounting to the more powerful group forces. But the sad thing is that those insurance plans don't really get prices discounted, they just get percentage discounts. And so it, you know, it becomes all the more reason to set those prices higher and higher and higher so that you can give a big percentage discount. And so, Price transparency becomes meaningless in a third party dominated world. Similarly with quality transparency. We uh, are asked to participate in pay for performance programs and, and statistical measures. Well these are things that, are, that, that, that have no meaning in terms of how a patient actually judges if they're getting good care or not. And, and, and that can be written off by just saying, well, you know, patients don't know enough to make those judgments. Uh, they're, they're just not smart enough. And that's a common attitude, even among physicians. But the statistical measurement is, is nothing more than a few proxy measures of things that are done frequently enough to bear statistical measurement and then and, and they usually are, are, amount to the lowest level of care. If you want real quality transparency, again, you need to have the patient involved and making the judgment of what works for them. Another major area uh, is that of health information technology. And um, this looks very different. Whether you look at it from a personalized level. I personally don't use an electronic medical record. I'm a psychiatrist. I think my patients are more secure having me jot down notes uh, and every now and then they'll be curious about them and I'll read them back to them and what they'll find is I just jotted down what they told me. Uh, and then I lock them up in a filing cabinet and unless uh, you know somebody breaks in with a crowbar like happened with Daniel Ellsberg's file in the early 1970s, you know, otherwise it just sits there. But uh, in, in the world of, uh, of, of third party dominance, we don't know what the security of these files will be. And so protecting the patient's confidentiality really does become a major difficulty. But nonetheless, there are, there are things for which computerized databases are just simply a valuable tool. It doesn't help me so much. I'm, I'm a kind of in the storytelling business. But if, uh, if the patient is, is in a, 
being managed with something where we really do keep track of numbers and we get recurrent tests and so forth, there's no question that a computerized record you know, allows that to happen very efficiently. But the push for the electronic medical record isn't really coming from that. It's coming from, uh, again, the world of third-party payers and therefore they place the highest goal being interoperability, which means um, I, my record can read your record and your record can read mine and the government can read both of ours and, uh, or the insurance company. And again, if your whole goal is to you know, m measure and, and have an effect on the population's health, and if you need to apply measures to conserve resources while you're trying to accomplish that statistical management is what you need and therefore we need to get everybody involved with these electronic records. Unless there's any question about that, here's a statement from recent congressional testimony by a man named David Whitlinger of the Intel Corporation who says, while the bulk of health care today is delivered in hospitals and clinics, today's acute care centered system is ultimately unsustainable in the future. The old one-on-one -on -one physician to patient paradigm will not suffice. We need to move away from the physician centered care delivery paradigm toward a patient centric model where delivery and funding are channeled via care teams within a, with a community approach toward care. IT is a powerful enabler to help provide the care necessary to meet this tide head on. And I imagine Intel will make a fairly good profit in the process of doing that. Well, I'm going to just breeze through a few other things. We hear a lot about wellness programs, prevention, and the use of medical homes. These are all good ideas, but again, they only are going to be workable to the extent that a patient buys into them and has a longitudinal relationship. Um, I've, I've said for years, you can tell how much uh, an insurance company is interested in preventive medicine when I, as a psychiatrist, write a prescription for a, an antidepressant called Wellbutrin, and then I have to call the insurance company to explain, no, I'm not using this for smoking cessation, this is for depression. You know, if, 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 the, if the insurance company expected a long-term relationship, they would pay for that. Medical homes um, are, are very big now, um, and, and uh, primary care organizations are promoting this. Insurance companies are promoting this. Uh, the idea being that we will find a way to pay the doctors to do all that record keeping and, and care coordination and, and so forth. Uh, however, what it also is going to involve is certification that your office practices this and you have the right number of staff and the right number of, of uh, 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 IT equipment and you know these procedures and you use evidence-based medicine and so forth and it become quite an industry in itself. And in the meantime, what is going to happen, what is happening with that is the notion that the physician's practice is more and more oriented to the third party payer rather than the person who's supposed to feel at home in the medical home uh, and, and that's the, the patient. And so I think there's an interesting contrast to be made between medical home as, as envisioned by third party payers and what we're now hearing about concierge uh, practice of medicine in which a patient pays a premium, in essence, for a real medical home. <clears throat> okay, after laying out the problem for 55 minutes, <laughs> let me give you two minutes of solutions. Um, what I've listed here are several things that in the marketplace I think allow for the return of control to patients. Uh, and the first is using a defined contribution from the employer or the government so that people can buy their own health insurance. And as people buy their own health insurance, again, they are likely to buy higher deductible insurance that allows them more responsibility but also more control of their day-to-day -day spending. Um, tax deductions and tax credits would empower individuals um, and the, the business of tax exclusion 
that's essentially the benefit you get by employers providing the insurance. So if you replace the tax exclusion with tax deductions or tax credits, then you get the even playing field in which people would be more likely to buy their own insurance. Um, health savings accounts are the most basic uh, reform of all, uh, and they, uh, they put uh, more dollars into the hands of patients with the, which to make their own judgments. Um, same with HRAs, which are uh, an employer-provided equivalent. Market-driven insurance plans. This is a fascinating idea. I've, uh, I put out reprints of some of my editorials uh, on the table, and in the packet I've included a, an article by a fellow named Dr. Jim Pendleton. Uh, Dr. Pendleton is a, a deceased psychiatrist. I'm sorry to say I never knew him. I wish I had. He's written a marvelous paper on one of the most interesting ideas of health insurance. Very basically, you know, health savings accounts are wonderful for, exp for expenses, you know, below the $2,500 or the $5,000, but they'll, they, they will do nothing to contain the costs of a hospitalization and other large items. Uh, Dr. Pendleton has a, I think, a very interesting idea of how to use in, in payments, in essence, reward patients who uh, do the shopping and, uh, and, and and negotiate with hospitals or obtain prices that are uh, under uh, the uh, uh, the community average and pay a premium if they choose something that's over. Um, state health insurance exchange is an interesting idea. It has a danger of morphing into a more government controlled uh, operation like the. Uh, um, uh, the, the operation in Massachusetts, but I think it is possible to do a health insurance exchange that just provides a better marketplace. And finally, interstate purchase of health insurance um, is a, an idea that would allow people in highly regulated, overpriced states to buy their health insurance uh, from less expensive places. And I will skip on then to finally uh, a vision for health insurance reform we should reform the market for health insurance in order to have as many people as possible using defined contributions and their own resources to purchase health insurance that protects them from financial catastrophe and uses co-insurance arrangements to restrain inflation and to elicit transparency of price and quality and enables them to control their own medical care in collaboration with their freely chosen physicians and other health professionals. And thank you very much.